Are you concerned about the power grab of the big six? If it is every club's right to press for more power and more revenue, what is right is that the institutions stay strong, because otherwise you kill the competition. Are the rules right? Are you comfortable that fans are protected oh. and get a good deal? That's a very leading question. <laughs> 80 quid for a ticket, 90 quid for a ticket. Let me stop you there, because that's not true. On this episode of The Overlap, I spoke with one of the most influential men in football. Richard Scudamore was the executive chairman of the Premier League for 19 years. We spoke about his early life and the big issues in the game just a week before an announcement that would stun the footballing world. But it was clear the warning signs were already there. Hi Richard, welcome to The Overlap. With all my guests, I like to go back to the very beginning, so just talk to me a little bit about your childhood. I was blessed, really. Well, I have two brothers, my mum and dad, both big NHS stalwarts. Mum was a nurse all her life, dad was in regional sort of health administration. But my dad was uh, polio disabled, so he was in a wheelchair all, all the time I knew him. He got it when he was 19. Yeah. Um, and so by the time the three of us came along, he was wheeling himself around. We didn't have a car till he, I was about 10, but when we did, it was like liberating for him. He you know, had hand controls and we used to go everywhere. We used to drive around. And uh, he was the one who got me into football, took me to John Attio's testimonial in 1966. Imagine when you're six, seven years yeah. old, you've got the World Cup final, which I can still vividly remember. Going running out to the garden, telling my mum Bobby Charlton had scored because he was my hero, still is, yeah. bless him. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was just great. That was my football kind of upbringing, yeah. really, and committed from literally committed from that day till this. How, how big an influence were your parents then in, in those early? It must have been a great challenge. Yeah, massive. I mean. Look, it's easy when you look back, you know, like, like all childhoods, you know, there were, there were tough times because we didn't yeah. have that much money, as you could probably imagine. Yeah. It was a tough, tough going. But looking back, it was interesting. We never fought, me and my brothers. It's, whether there's something yeah. come, takes over, we never really squabbled. Like the Nevilles. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> But it was very formative. And my dad, he had a full-time job. He also was national chairman of a disabled charity. Oh, so yeah, it was, it was very formative, very important. My dad, probably my biggest mentor. Yeah, was that where your leadership came from, you think? Um, I think so. It was the way he did it. He used to, I mean, like, they used to go out collecting, you know, these, these flag days where you see them, you know, shaking tins. And he just had a marvellous ability to engage people. He would be st sat there in his chair, which is, you know, obstructing the pavement yeah. anyway, but then he would catch people from sort of 20, 30 yards away, make eye contact with them, and it's impossible for them to walk yeah. by without putting some money in the tin. <laughs> and it was just, you just watched him in action. And he was, yeah, he was quite something to watch. And I spent a lot of time watching him. Is that where you yeah. got your negotiating skills from? <laughs> I don't know. That first football experience that you've just touched on before, was that where you fell in love with football? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have every shoot magazine from, from 1968 all the way through the summer specials, the World Cup specials, every single one. Yeah. I've still got them at home, you know, in pristine, pretty much pristine condition. They've, you know, they're all in chronological order. I've got them all. The Panini stickers as well? Yeah, or? yeah, all that. The stickers, the coins, the SO World Cup coins, the shell badges. I mean, you, you know, you name it. Yeah, we've got it all. And what was your first <laughs> job then? Go on to work. What was your first job? Well, this is I kind of, again, it links into football because of my first paid job. I used to belong to a youth club whose it was run by a lady whose husband was about to give up work to buy a newsagent shop. And the reason he wanted to buy a newsagent shop is because he was heading towards the Football League refereeing. And that got me into his sort of fraternity. And you became a referee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got as far as, you know, getting to the to the level below the Football League. Not, I would have been Football League line had I not given up that year because I had to go off to work in Scotland and it was yeah. impossible to transfer. I, I, I looked at it, but I couldn't. So career I had to take over at that point. And then you went to the Yellow Pages. Yes. I've been lucky in the sense that I've been in three industries when they were at their pomp and on yeah. the rise. And so yeah. the you know, Yellow Pages back in the 80s was was really kind of what you know yeah. kept a lot of local businesses going. And that was brilliant experience because they literally threw me in at the deep end and said, here's a bag, you know, go sell. And I did. But the training was good. The training was absolutely excellent. Yeah. Stuff that stays with you forever. And then the Thompson, the newspaper people came along and I went to them and had a decent job with them as UK sales and marketing director. And that was again good. And that first exposure into media, I mean, you became famous for negotiating Premier League broadcast rights. Was that down to those early years at Thompson Media Group? Yeah, I think the sales training, I think the negotiation training, all formative stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
talk to me about your first job in football administration. Well, I, there was three things. I can't remember chronologically. I'll have to go back. There was three things. I was social secretary for the Referees Association. And then there was the Bristol and District League. I was the referees representative on that. But then I got involved helping out you know, with some of the administration of, of all that. So what was interesting, when I think back to getting my, my real break in football, which was the job at the Football League, the CEO of the Football League in 1997, I think what was interesting then on the CV, of course, was that I'd been involved in football administration. So I'd gone off and done media and I'd done you know, various you know, things uh, commercially. But the fact that I'd done football administration, I think probably stood me out from a few on the list. And also, I mean, this might sound crazy, the fact I was from Bristol, because in football politics, not being from Manchester and Liverpool uh, or London <laughs> right. was... You know, That's how it works, is you, it? Well, you thought, I'm just saying, I think it was neutral. Yes, in yeah. fact, neutral to the point of people thinking, oh, well... Bristol, yeah. that's not a serious... Don't worry about that. That's them. not a serious <laughs> football place, <Yeah. laughs> you know. You talk about that big break in 97. What was the Football League like when you arrived? Um, it won't surprise you that they were in some form of discord. I mean, Around? it's only thanks to Barry Fry that I'm still here. Well, literally, week one, I had a call that said, at least two and three didn't want a chief exec, and therefore we're going to, you know, basically terminate me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd been there a week. So I, uh, well, there was a meeting called and Leagues 2 and 3 got together in a room and I turned up uh, to speak to them and basically they said, sorry, we don't really want you. We've decided we don't want a chief exec. The championship or the League 1 might want one, but we don't want one. So, you know, if, they, if you want to still be employed by them, we'll go and speak to them, but we don't want you. And Barry Fry stood up and said, stop, this is crazy. At least listen to what he's got to say. And we laugh about it to this day, because so, uh, he basically quelled them down, g gave me a platform, I spoke to them and said, look, you're all at war, you're all, all, it's all all over the place, it needs a bit of cajoling, I'm here now, this is me, and this is what I think you should do. And we got 69 of the 72 to say yes. That was my first eight weeks. And in terms of that, I mean, that's an early introduction into the, I suppose, politics of football? Yeah, yeah. Well, OK, football is all about those that play, but all those that play, play for clubs. And so the unit of football, I've always believed, is the club. Yeah. The club is it. There's always going to be healthy sometimes, but sometimes unhealthy tension between them. Because yeah. they're all competing, yeah. A, for the same resources, and B, they all want to win. So somebody has to be the counterbalance to that, that says, stop. It is not in your best interests for this, you know, for, for all this chaos to exist. Whoever's got hold of that central ring has to try and hold it together, despite there always being inevitable tensions, you know, from clubs on the, out, on the outside, inevitable. And you must have impressed somebody, because within a couple of years of starting at the <laughs> Football League, you ended up as the CEO of the Premier League. Did you always have your eyes on that no, top job? No, not really. No, 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 never. No, I never really had my eyes on any job, to be honest. I mean, I just, it was an interesting time. It was done by a headhunting company, okay. and I, I think there was about six or seven people down onto a shortlist, and then they got down to two. And I think it was down. It was a split decision. I think there was a, eight people on the panel, and I think I was. It was four all for me and another candidate, and it was Sir Peter Hill Wood from um, Arsenal. Arsenal, who basically says, "I'm the chairman. I don't know whether I've got a chairman's casting vote or not, but I'm going with Scudamore." And that's how it happened. Again, fortuitous. Um, and for me, the, yeah, <laughs> what, about and what was the brief? The brief was to make sure that the, the, the asset that is the Premier League is, is, is properly realised. That, that was the brief. When you first got to the Premier League, the TV deal was around 670 million. And well, you took it up to 1.2 billion. Yeah, well, it's, quite, it's quite interesting, the numbers. Rather yeah. than TV deals, it's easier to think in terms of annual revenues. Yeah. So in, in many ways, because that's really yeah. what matters. And so, the, yeah, the league revenues were about 140 million in the season before I got there, yeah. And you took it too? It was 3.3 .3 billion when I left, yeah. In that first deal that you did, how did you, you seem to double it nearly? Yeah, it yeah, seem. nearly did. Yeah, nearly did. How well, did we you had, do that? Well, there's two things that are vastly important. One is the, the compelling content. The second thing is competitive tension. And you have to make sure, you know, that when things are around the world, it's the same. When you're selling around the world, if you've got some competitive tension, things tend to, you know, tend to get better. And we had at the time, if you remember, this was when 
everybody, cable TV was big. We had all, we had you know, the, the big cable companies, Telewest, we had ITV Digital was in the yeah. marketplace. Obviously we had Sky. Um, there was a lot of competition around and, you know, obviously they'd seen what had happened in the first, you know, few years with it. So we were able to create some competitive tension. And traditionally across those, those years, we were, you know, people came along and wanted to compete for the rights. And that's what drives, you know, the way you package the rights, the way you deal with the rights, that's really what drove value. I remember when I joined Sky 10 years ago and used to go in on Monday night football and we'd get there at 9, 10 in the morning and obviously it was always an extremely tense time around negotiations. the negotiations yeah. time, you can imagine. And it was the phrase that I actually re remember most around those times were that Scudamore's introduced a bogeyman again. <laughs> 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 Thank you, man. You know, whether it be the Disney Channel, UK Gold, Amazon, obviously most recently, Satanta, ESPN, ITV, all those companies, they're almost like this, these imaginary bidders being sports at one point, there was this big thing. Was that a tactic? I mean, it obviously sounds well, like it was. Look, they're big boys, aren't they? You know, I have brilliant relationships <laughs> with the guys at Sky, you know, fantastic, brilliant relationships. But they, they're in the commercial world too. They know that they're buying and we're selling. You know, and, and whilst the relationship is excellent, you know, 90, 99% of the time the relationship is excellent, but come that period that you talk about, yeah. we have to go our separate ways. It's regulated, it's, you know, it's proper, we run open processes. And of course, what's my job? My job is to invite as many interested parties to the party as want to turn up. Their job is to try and make sure, you know, there aren't that many interested parties and they can get it for, you know, maybe slightly, slightly more favor favorably. But yeah, we've always managed to introduce interested parties into the mix. Your last bogey man was Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you call them that? <laughs> all sorts of things go on all the time. There's always people meeting in smoke-filled rooms. Are you comfortable that fans are protected well, and get a good deal? 80 quid for a ticket, 90 quid for a ticket. But let me stop you there, because that's not true. But, but the rules, are the rules right? What was it like working for 20 bosses? It was entertaining. It was entertaining and it was fun. I mean, Philip Carter was hugely supportive. The guy, you know, he was really one of the founding fathers of the Premier League, David Dean. Um, and, you know, Alan Sugar was round the table, Freddie Shepherd, you know, Douglas Hall. I mean, there were some real characters around the table. The public persona that some people have is often not you know, not, not the same when you get to know them. I mean, hugely supportive. Ken Bates was the most supportive. When things got tough around the table, Ken Bates was likely to be the person who would say, we are the clubs, we have one view, we have professionals paid to run this league, we should let them get on with the job, what is your recommendation? And you'd give your recommendation and, and there'd be a vote and it would carry. Who was the toughest to please? You can't go about the job wanting to please people, if, it, if that sounds odd. Mm. I don't want to sound that, that sounds too arrogant because clearly you worked for them, but you almost on a daily basis, you have to remember that you're trying to work for all of them, which means you don't therefore work for any of them mm. singularly. It is perfectly possible for the Premier League to have a view that is not exactly the same as any one of the 20, but you have to try to come up with a view that is like a collaborative view it's not the consensual view that everybody no. agrees with. It's just a view that makes sense that we can move forward. And you have to do it fairly quickly and you have to communicate quickly and you can't spend too much time looking back. I mean, you're old, obviously somebody who, oh, I know you have huge regard for Sir Alex. That's Sir Alex mentality, isn't it? You know, there's no time to celebrate really. You know, you win one title, you know, <laughs> we're on to the next. The 14 and six rule where obviously 14 clubs have to vote for any motion, any change. Do you like it? Should it stay? What I believe is one club, one vote is absolutely right. You know, so you can't, in my view, create super votes for those who've been it the longest and all that stuff. I think it starts to get very complicated. So it's a simple members club. If you're one of the 20 around that table, you get a vote. So that's the most important thing. Whether the 14, 20 is right or wrong, I'm not so, so fixed about, except for what I think is very interesting over what is now nearly 30 years, it has stood the league in good stead because it's a very conservative constitution where it needs 14 to change anything. Project Big Picture, a power grab, many suggested by the top six. It's not conceivable that Big Picture would have ever been brought forward whilst you were the CEO with the FA, top six and EFL all working and blindsiding you 
as a CEO. That's not conceivable, is it? <laughs> I don't, but that's for others, that's for, that's for others to, to, to decide. Look, all sorts of things go on all the time. So, you know, people are meeting in rooms, it's always happened ever since- Away from you? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. And this is why, you, you know, hear it's, about never, it? it's never been any different. Even, well, go back to the start of the football league, go all the way back to 1997, I arrive and they're already saying, you know, they're already in a room. I went to my first big meeting where they couldn't even decide whether they wanted to break and adjourn to have individual group meetings with their divisions. So there's always people meeting in, you know, people call smoke-filled rooms. It's not smoke-filled rooms anymore, but there's always subgroups going on. Of course, but which is why I say you've got to let a lot of it go mm -hmm. <laughs> and concentrate on what the real job is. I mean, these things always happen. It's a triangle, isn't it? So sometimes the FA is getting close to the Football League to try and manoeuvre the Premier League. Sometimes the Premier League is getting together with the Football League to try and sometimes, you know, sometimes manoeuvre the FA. But that's the health of it in some ways, because that keeps everybody honest. Are you concerned about the power grab of the big six, particularly with regards to the fact that Champions League expansion is now on the table and will be seen as mm. a devastating move for domestic football by some Premier League clubs? <laughs> that's a very leading question. It's a good question. <laughs> I'll answer that in a more rounded sense. I absolutely believe it is every club's right to press for more power, more influence and more revenue. That's what the game is about. The game is about me running my club, wanting the best for my club. I think the best for my club is I'd like as much money as I can, I'd like the best players that I can, I'd like the best manager I can and I'd like more of that than anybody else because I know if I get all those things together and get it right, I'm likely to, not always, likely to win. And I want to win every game, and I want to win every game 5-0, I want to win every competition I enter, I want to dominate. There's nothing wrong with that at all, okay? And there's nothing wrong that every club <laughs> feels like that. And therefore that creates a dynamic that pushes this way. What is right is that the institutions stay strong, whether that's, as I said, the Premier League, the Football League, the FA, somebody has to stay strong and say, sorry, you can't have it all your own way because otherwise you kill the competition. And the great bit about our Premier League and our ecosystem, our Football League, is because it's transient. If you went back to the 1980s, you know, there would be a different name in, the, in that six mm. than there are today. If you went back to the 70s, it would be a different set of names. It's transient. And thank goodness that there are, uh, those names change from time to time. Richard, I've got first-hand experience of all of the five major stakeholders in the game, from the LMA helping with my contracts uh, when I was a coach for a brief period of time. I was a management committee member of the PFA and I've helped them recently. Obviously the Premier League, I was a player and now I commentate on it. The FL, I'm now a club owner and go to the League Two meetings. And the FA, I was the England player and obviously an England coach for many years. And it takes a lot for me, having worked with those organisations, to come to the conclusion that I feel that the game needs an independent regulator. I, I don't believe the current structure works. I don't believe that the current structure allows for a fairer game and a better game all round. Are you with me? No. Why? <laughs> um, look, let's cut it down. To, the truth is, when it comes down to it all, what is the main kernel of what you want to be regulated independently? And I bet when you strip it all away, it's fundamentally the distribution of money. I don't think you really want an independent regulator to run, you know, PGMO or the referees. The youth systems work, the player registration systems work, the fixtures work, and it's all regulated. The Football League have their regulations, Premier League have theirs, FA have theirs. The three organisations know how it all works between them, that's all written down, so who makes what decisions? Because nobody runs the industry, so there's nobody in the UK runs the grocery industry, you know, Tesco's have got Tesco's, Aldi's, they've got the corner shops, you've got your, 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 your there is an industry, but nobody regulates, you know, the whole thing, because it's at its core, there's an economic element. And therefore, in my view, the purpose when people talk about an independent regulator is somebody that can decide, well, you know, you've got to give this people that money or you've got to give these people that. It's more about the distribution of money. And when I hear phrases, you know, like there's enough money in the game to go round, the truth of the matter is that those people who've generated the income have generated their own income. The league, the Premier League have generated their, on, based on their IP, the Football League will generate their own income based on their intellectual property, whether it be TV rights or commercial rights, the FA will generate theirs. You have to separate that out, in my view, and then you have to come together 
And, and as they do, those three bodies regulate the bits that need regulating. But the, the, I can't see any need for an independent regulator because nobody should be able to tell one element of those three how much of your money you've got to give to somebody else. That should be done by negotiation, by conscience, by principles, and unlike they are now. The, the, the principles are such, though, that the Premier League clubs vote for their own needs, as you suggested. It isn't just well, distribution well, that, of funds. But let me stop you there, because that's not true. I mean, solidarity payments go back a long way, ever since the Premier League was formed. You're uh, happy with the distribution of funds as it currently is? Look, at the end of the day, everybody's got to learn. The whole football ecosystem will be better off if everybody was able to exist and live on the income that they can legitimately generate. It's a fool system that thinks you can rely on other people funding you. It just is unsustainable. And therefore, I've always believed, even when I ran you know, the Football League, I've always believed the Football League's fortunes are about gearing the economics of the Football League to their own income. But because of the huge chasm that exists between the Championship and the Premier League, we have this desperation that exists within the game that means that the Football League clubs are desperate to try and get that extra £94 million mm -hmm. a year, mm -hmm. which you get from being the top of the Championship to the bottom of the Premier League. Surely we need to connect that better. And distribution of funds is only one area, but it is a major issue. But you know, a fit and proper persons test, a licensing of football league clubs. We've got to make sure that the right and proper owners come into English football. How we approach issues like diversity and inclusion. The reason I mention that is because, you know, we've got show racism, the red card, we've got kick it out, we've got Black Lives Matter, we've got five or six different campaigns within the five stakeholders. We can't even come together to create one campaign within football and collaborate on such a major social issue. So football to me hasn't demonstrated that it can be fair around distribution of funds. Issues like Champions League expansion, diversity and inclusion, and how we approach it as a collective. Fit and proper persons tests and license it for owners. A better deal for fans on transport and ticket prices. All these things are massive issues. This game means too much, whereby it needs to be, in my view, to be regulated because the Premier League does have the power. And it is transient. You said before, 48 people you've had to deal with, 48 different clubs. So it is transient, so it's not always the same clubs in that league. But that desperation has got to be removed and we have to have a more sustainable, fairer, better game, surely for all. You can't deconstruct that speech without taking on individual bits. Let's just take owners and directors test. When was the last person who was inappropriate to own a Premier League club join the Premier League? Those rules were changed post Portsmouth back in 2009-10. We're, we're 13 years on from those rules. Now, I, I can't sit here in this and discuss what goes you're on at the football with, league. You happy with Burnley? Sorry? You happy with Burnley? The well, recent takeover of Burnley? At the end of the day, it's perfectly legitimate. It's within the rules. It's within, you know, it's but within the, rules, the proportions. Are the rules right? You're making the case for an independent regulator. The Premier League rule book was about this big, you know, in 1999. It's now this big. There is masses of regulation. We don't need more regulation. The attractiveness of getting to the Premier League is what drives the championship. If it was no jeopardy, if there was nothing attractive at the top, if it was... You 100 know, million to 6 million. We well, it's not, though, is it? Because of parachute payments but, and everything uh, else. No, but if you're, if you're trying... The, the top of the championship, I think, is 6, 7 million pounds. The bottom of the Premier League is 100 million. We can't be comfortable with that gap, surely. Well, the, but the people who finish at the top will get promoted, won't they? And the parachute payments, when they come back down... What you cannot have, in my view, is an independent regulator who comes... Independent of whom? Who are they representing? Who are they... The who, game? The who, fan? Who, well, who, what is the game? The game. The game is the wider public. It's the biggest game in the country. I mean, I'm sat here today with an American investment bank having to lend the championship £120 million. I feel really uneasy about that. Well, I've always felt uneasy about anybody borrowing anything. But what you've got is a situation where the pandemic has caused something unforeseen and unheard of. And therefore, even I, in discussions in the last couple of years, over the last 18 months, have come to the view that for a short-term crisis, there might have to be a short-term borrowing. Because if you believe that this is a one-off, which I do, and if you believe the pandemic is, is going to be over relatively soon, and if you believe things are going to go back to normal, then I think there is a case for borrowing money in the, to, to see you through this crisis with a view to then paying it back when thing, things improve. But it's the only time I can ever see, really, that there should be this centralised, institutionalised borrowing, and I think it's a one-off. And I think that's a separate issue entirely you from whether there should be get, an independent regulator. Are you comfortable regulator. that fans get a good deal in football, then? 
comfortable that fans get a good deal? It's a broad question, I know, <laughs> but are you comfortable that fans are protected well, and get a good deal? Um, I, again, I can't answer the question. 80 because, quid for a ticket, 90 quid for a that's ticket. Not, but that's not every ticket, is it? I mean, you know, you know the season tickets. Fans are being priced out, the season, But they're not being priced out, are they? they? Are. Well, well, OK, we will see. When we're allowed to come back in, we'll see how many want to come back and we'll see how many want to, you know, see how many want to take these places. But generally, the season ticket pricing, look at the away ticket pricing cap that the Premier League introduced, they are capable of regulating themselves on some of these things. What about the role of the FA? I mean, they're the, quote, governing body. But in essence, they are a... I'm not going to be disrespectful that by saying that they're a puppy dog to the Premier League, but they are completely in the hands of the Premier League. But except for it goes to, in my view, the fundamental flaw with your independent regulator argument, what people expect the FA to run the entire industry. They don't. They don't run the industry of football. They run the bits that the FA runs, and they run very well. The disciplinary side, pretty much, the, and the regulatory side that affects the whole game. So when it comes the to betting... They run the guff bits, but they are responsible for grassroots football. Of course, they and they run but grassroots they get, football. They only have a pittance compared to the vast fortunes of the Premier League to run grassroots football. Yeah, but the, I mean, but the Premier League itself like, uh, is still putting tens of millions into the football foundation and grassroots football relative to what other countries are doing. The bits that they're responsible for, I've always believed it, they do, they do a good job with the bits they're responsible for, but they're not responsible for everything. What, what you are tapping into is that you'd, th you'd like the FA to somehow be uber powerful and be able to tell the Premier League, instead of giving, giving the Football League you know, 100 million, give them 500 million and all that stuff. That's not the role of the FA, can never be. No, but I believe there is enough money to create an incredible Premier League with fantastically paid players, with wonderful stadiums, a competitive EFL that is nearer to the Premier League in income terms than it currently is. The fantastic coaching system, great facilities, great grassroots, a great England team. I believe there is a fairer distribution of funds that could create a better game. That's never going to happen with the current system that exists and the current structure that exists. That's why I want it changed. And I I've, represent, I've represented all those five stakeholders, yep. so I've got no allegiance to one over the other. I actually like them all. They've all do great jobs individually. I just want to see a fairer game. But where we are at odds, and we can sit here yeah. for hours, I will never Shall believe <laughs> that there is an independent group that can come along and tell the Premier League there's enough, you should give a big wedge of this money down here. What the Premier League does is remarkable. It gives away over 15% of its income. It's the biggest charity con contributor, um, you know, in the UK. It's the biggest, you know, distributor of, of solidarity funds. It does more in terms of community. It does masses amounts, but there is no amount of money you can give away that's going to stop. All that will do is create bigger madness. <laughs> The more money the Football League gets, if it keep, continues to spend beyond its means, I'm afraid there's going to have to be... The way forward is, is to live more people living within their own means. And I'm afraid that it, it is not going to be solved by, by relying on other people's money. I just don't believe it as a principle. The European Super League was announced. Should the top six be punished? There has to be some consequences. <laughs> have you changed your opinion that independent regulation is needed? Enough is enough. It's gone beyond the tipping point. But I don't believe life will ever be the same after last summer. You think there will be changes? Yeah, I think there will be changes. Just a week later, the news of the proposed breakaway Super League broke and shocked the football world. So I had to get Richard back to see if he was now ready to accept that football governance must change. So Richard, in the week last Sunday, the football world changed. What have the last 10 days been like for you? Well, they've been full on and intense because obviously this was something that anybody who knows me or knows anything about me knows I would have found completely unacceptable. And I've been counselling the clubs for a long time about how unacceptable such a move would be to actually suddenly break for the border and try to create any form of closed competition was just flawed in its concept and I absolutely knew to my core fundamentally the fan base and the fabric that is English football wouldn't let it happen. Just tell us about the first time you heard of the proposal and where you were and how you found out. Oh there was discussions or you know, there was stuff flying around, rumours flying around maybe six months, nine months, twelve months ago. It's all been out there in the ether but it's all been used as a um, 
a bargaining chip and a threat for a long time. If I go back to, we have a strategic review of the Premier League back in 2014-15 that resulted in some changes to the, to the revenue formula on international revenue just before I left in 2018. It took three or four years to, to get that through. And that was the sort of the existential threat that was kind of behind the bargaining positions was, you know, there's this, this European Super League. But yeah, it, it's been rumbling for, you know, for a very long time. And a week last Sunday, your thoughts? Well, when it was pretty certain it was it was about to launch, our thoughts were clear. I mean, I think, you know, obviously at that point I was in discussions with a lot of people, particularly Richard Masters and, and Gary Hoffman at the Premier League. And the thought was, what, what can we do to uh, to make sure this uh, this doesn't happen? And, and Richard and Gary, the board of the Premier League, wrote to all 20 clubs, making it quite clear, A, any one of you are thinking of doing this, think again. There's rules that say you can't do this effectively without express board permission. And a line in that letter that basically said, there is no circumstances under which we can see the board would ever give you permission to do this. So think again. Of course, it, it, you know, it didn't stop <laughs> the announcement coming out a bit later. But by which time the media had got hold of it, it was already a raging issue. And then by Monday, Tuesday, thank goodness, players, fans, media yourselves included piled in, prime ministers even, op- leaders of opposition piled in. And the thing was effectively, from the English club's perspective anyway, stopped by Tuesday night. You were called, you said, by Richard Masters to try and help and it was reported that you were brought in as a special advisor. What specifically were you asked to advise on and what advice did you give? Well, I can't give you the specific details, but clearly these were uncharted territory. So I was helping them, you know, generally with their strategy, generally with their approach, just generally there to offer advice. And also I was able to have some conversations, you know, with some club people as the week unfolded. Was there panic? No, actually, it was very controlled because when you know right is on your side, (laughs) it's much easier to be, you know, fairly calm. And they, they, they handled it very, very well. What's your feeling now towards those six clubs, particularly the owners and the executive people who you've worked with and know? I think it's a mixture. It's a mixture of sadness. None of them can say they wouldn't have known my, my view on this because I've expressed it many times. It's sadness that they've led themselves into this because actually it's a completely flawed concept. For, the, for, for English football, it's just so flawed. And the idea that they couldn't see it. And when you see you know, things that comments, and it, you know, you, you can, I don't need to name names, but when you see people even in their apologies saying things like, you know, what we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what our fans would want us to do. And yet you didn't spend one iota talking to those fans that have reacted. I mean, it just you don't know where to start in terms of your, if you like, contempt for the ill thought through nature of the whole thing. They've tried to blindside the Premier League and its executive twice now these clubs in the last eight months. How can we ever trust them? Well, first of all, there's no switch that you can turn that suddenly builds back trust with these people for the fan bases. And so that's a gone. And so therefore, I'm afraid it is a fairly long, fairly difficult road back. I mean, the fact is English football has, has built those clubs into, in, into what they are. And my hope is that they will reflect, take a jolly good look in and say, right, what can we do now, you know, to make sure English football continues to be strong. You, know, you can stick to the negatives all you like about, you know, this, this, this and this. But after a period of, you know, period of some healing, we have to rebuild this thing. But it's not, it's not sticking to negatives. I think that, to be fair, the fan base in this country, broadcasters in this country, other club owners in this country are massively concerned. Yeah. They feel that ultimately the power base in English football is in the hands of dangerous individuals. And we're being told categorically by two of the main protagonists in this project that it's on standby and that it's going to come back. But you're not being told that by two of the English clubs, are you? you? But I don't trust the English clubs because they've twice tried to blindside us. So what we have to listen to is that there are 12 clubs that have signed up to a legally binding contract and two of the main protagonists who haven't left the Super League yet are saying they can't leave, they're staying in and this will come back to the table. Well, uh, look, let's, let's be practical. I think the, the, the Premier League rulebook, the UEFA rulebook, FIFA, the, the football institutions stayed strong. Right, they, and they do. They are strong, and I don't think this could have happened. Now, of course, you know the protagonists. I'm sure hired lots of lawyers, and, and paid lots of money to, to to be told how this could happen. But I do still think that the fundamental regulatory block is strong enough to make this not happen. 
I also know for certain that the Premier League will be you know, looking at the regulatory framework. But there's nothing I can tell you in this interview that suddenly <laughs> convinces a whole load of fans, not just of the six clubs involved, but the football fans generally, that uh, you know, everything's going to be OK tomorrow, because I think it's, it's not going to be like that. What message would you send to Florentino Perez, who is adamant that this thing is on standby and it's coming back? and the English clubs will hmm. be in it. I, I wouldn't have any message um, for them. But he's calling it on to the whole of English football. He's calling it on, he's saying this thing is coming back. Well, he's he's antagonising us. Well, let, but let him, let the Spanish deal with that, let Europe, Europe deal with that. I'm not going to usually get, He usually gets what he wants. Well, he's not going to get what he wants in terms of a European Super League. You cannot possibly see. And it's, who knows what six clubs it'll be in a year's time, five years time, 10 years time. And that's the whole, you know, when you go to the, the temerity of the whole thing was that these six, it was a slice in time, wasn't it? Which is completely wrong. I mean, if you go back 10 years, it'd have been a different six. 20 years, it'd have been a different six. Six years time, it might be a different six. It can't happen. And I don't really give, I, there's nothing I have to say because I'm not that interested in what Mr. Perez has to say or any of the others, quite frankly. We had this conversation three weeks ago where I stated that my view that the football governance is dysfunctional, it doesn't work, that individually the key stakeholders, whether it be the Premier League, the FL, the FA, LMA and PFA, the five major stakeholders and the F Football Supporters Association, they're all individually fantastic associations, they have good people, they make mistakes like all others, but when you look at sort of the wider interests of the game, it just fails. When the pinch point comes, particularly around money, it just falls over and my view quite clearly is that it needs to change and I think I feel vindicated in my view of what I said three weeks ago around regulation being introduced into the Premier League into football to protect the interests of the wider game and the fans have you changed your opinion that regulation is needed independent regulation is needed I absolutely have not changed my view that independent regulation is needed. You think football because is fit the, for purpose? Yeah, of course. And I think it's fit for How purpose. How can you say that, Richard, because after what's happened? Because of fundamentally what it is. Professional football, in my view, there's two things. One, of course, is this whole promotion and relegation and the English system of fluidity where clubs come up, they go down, they come up, go down. The most offensive part, I think, for everybody of the European Super League, amongst many other things that were offensive, is this closed system, because it is a complete anathema. Because no matter how unrealistic your expectations, you, the idea that you can form a team behind the Dog and Duck pub, work your way up through the pyramid, whether it be Salford FC or whether it be anybody else, you can eventually get to the very top. But there's something that's older than that tradition, and that is the ability of people to invest, to be better than the next person. And back in 1888, when William McGregor, Aston Villa, he was a factory owner who was paying people a little bit more than the factory next door. That's where the league formed. So that's an older principle, even than promotion and relegation. And fundamentally, those two things don't alter. And we th I think the regulatory framework that manages those, it's not easy because you have to allow for promotion and relegation, because that's the lifeblood of it, and boy, did the fans make that clear <laughs> this week. That is the fundamental core of the argument, was the, was the killing the dream from my club to be able to move up and down. But the other key factor in all that is the finances of football. And again, that's no more straightforward from an independent regulator who will not know as much about that as, as the clubs themselves. Because effectively, self-regulation is about the clubs and the leagues coming up with a regulatory framework that allows things to breathe. And that club investment issue is a very difficult issue. And that's why I don't think it needs an independent regulator to regulate it. Richard, you go back to sort of the historic principles of football where local businessmen invested in football clubs to try and put something back in their own community and to win and to challenge. Yeah. We understand that the Premier League has changed that dynamic and there is international investment coming to the Premier League. And that's been for, for good and bad. There's no doubt there is good come from that as well. Participation of international players, international coaching staff, international investment has brought great good to the game. However, it's gone above and beyond to the point whereby those owners are now coming in and looking to exploit not only those clubs themselves, 
but also change the dynamic for every other club in this league and to the detriment of every other club in this league. That is dangerous and that needs independent regulation in my view because these people are not going away. No, it doesn't need independent regulation. I didn't say no to different regulation or more regulation. I said no to independent regulation. So you think the Premier League themselves, as clubs, can vote in their own regulations? Is absolutely. That not... in, con in conjunction with the FA, with UEFA, with their rules, with our rules, absolutely can. And I believe the current regulatory regime doesn't allow these owners to come in and change the formats of competitions. It doesn't because it needs, it, it certainly needs 14 round the Premier League table and six are never going to get there. And so, I mean... But what if they brought a seventh club in? What if they went to Mike Ashley at Newcastle, the greedy six, and they said... Need, sorry, they need 14 to do something positively. But well, let's say they grab 14. No, like... No, but my point is, Richard, these, these people but, okay. are not willing to stop I anything to get I money. I 100% agree with you. I 100% agree with you that people shouldn't be able to buy clubs, come in, and from the time they come in, agitate to change the fundamental structures and basis of our league. I absolutely agree with you. But I do believe so what that is the, in place? the current regulatory regime stops them from doing it. What do you say to the fan base at this moment in time in this country that have just had enough. This is the tipping point. Well, but had enough of what? Rich, Richard, they've had enough of everything. I understand. Have been well, exploited, they, no, 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 no. have been treated as consumers, has been treated as customers, has not been consulted. Well, hold on a minute. Enough is enough. It's gone beyond the tipping point. You must accept that Prince William, royal family, the government, the opposition, everybody in this country in the last week is now alerted to the greed and selfishness of the owners I, within the top six. I, listen, what's happened... I think, you know, we're still in the grieving period. What has happened is... I'm still in the angry period. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I've not got to grieve yet. I understand you are. I understand you are. But take a step back. What's happened is what should happen. And, and I, these people came up with something that they wanted to do for reasons only they can explain. Not me. I'm not sitting here today trying to explain why any of them thought this was a good idea. I'm the person who's been telling them for years that this was a crazy idea and could never happen. But I... And so... What's actually happened in the last week is it's been stopped. But it wasn't, the, pre the, right but it wasn't the Premier League regulations that stopped them. It was the weight of support from fans, government, the royal family, the wider game that put pressure on them to stop this. Yeah. It wasn't the Premier League no. constitution that stopped well, them. We don't know. because that We don't know, Gary. Well, you do know, Richard. Sorry. You know, you're, more, you're more sorry. aware than I okay, am. Let me tell you. I know what stopped it this week. And you're right. It was an alchemy of all those things. It was an alchemy of... Fan pressure, media pressure, political pressure, because it was such a rank bad idea. So that it's been stopped. But had it got any further than this week, the regulatory regime would have been tested. And I still believe the English courts would have said these rules are solid. So let's just take the distribution of funding across the game yeah. to grassroots, to the EFL, to other organisations, the FA. You still believe that the Premier League clubs, the owners of those Premier League clubs that we don't trust, that you can't even trust anymore, are the people that should be in control and charge of distributing the funding of money in this country in football. No, no, no. no. But they are. They are controlling they are, the though. distribution of funding of the money that they have generated no, for they their is, competition. They is a transient set of clubs. So they are not permanent. Of course. They are uncertain. So Nottingham Forest, Aston Villa, I don't know how many clubs exist outside of the actual Premier League that have been in the Premier League. So the Premier League there's has 47, different... 47, I think. Yeah, together, so there's 47 49. of the 92 clubs have been in the Premier yeah. League. They is not... The top six. No, no, no. They is football. But sorry, the you believe six. the Premier League owners of one particular time should be in charge of distribution of funding in football? Of the money that they generate in that particular year, yes. Because really? it's their money. Still? Yes, still. Absolutely still. That was the whole point of forming the Premier League in 1992. They only generate money on an annual is, basis. You think the system is fair? What do you mean six, fair? Six, seven million pounds for the top of the championship, 100 million for the bottom of the Premier League. This is a very, very difficult But do you concept. believe it's fair? Of course I think. Well, look, it's, it's proportionate. At the end of the day... It's disproportionate. No, it's not disproportionate. Somebody's decided that the Premier League commercial rights are extremely valuable, right? And somebody has decided in the free market that these rights are worth this amount of money. And the Premier League contract and earn that money. What do they do with that money? Well, we know what they do with that money. 85% of it or so goes to the clubs that are in membership of the league in any one season. Because why? Because we want those teams to compete. Because what's very interesting about this dynamic is the most aggrieved group ought to be 
in some ways, whether it's Project Big Picture or European Super League, the 14 <laughs> clubs that are not well, the 14 not, not change in the every six. year. Of course, but that's okay. But when they're in, they have to compete. So the most important thing to the Premier League, and I don't, and there's no point in apologising for it. In my view, the most important thing for the Premier League is that the bulk of the money is distributed by the members who've earned that money, whose intellectual property has been sold. It's it's only the 380 games when they play each other. That's what's been sold, and that money, 85% of it, is retained by the clubs to create a competitive and compelling competition. That's the fundamental building block. But no other league gives away all that they give away. So, so the money that gets distributed throughout the pyramid, 14, 15%, is a, is a huge amount of money, but there's no amount of money that you can give away that's going to turn every club in the Football League into a, a Premier League club. And therefore, what you've got is a situation where if you were to give more away, then the 14 clubs aren't able to compete with the six, and on, on it goes. But the huge desperation that's created by the chase for the Premier League, because of the distance between the six million and the 100 million, creates something that is unsavoury and inappropriate and lacks compassion. And that is, as I said So how are the 20 on, clubs ever going to vote to be more fair? Sorry? They're never going to vote to be more fair with the distribution of funding. Which but, creates a better and more balanced game. Except for you cannot, there's no way you're going to take, in my view, much more than the 14 or 15% that is distributed. There's no, there's really in some ways no point because what you've, I, I, you only exacerbate the problems because what you've got to do, the Premier League is a ladder. The Premier League is a ladder from the bottom to the top. And at the very top, those clubs at the very top go on to compete in Europe. Now, let's hope it stays that way, where you go on to compete in the UA for competitions. And therefore, you know, the Premier League's never made any apology, I don't think, for the fact that, that it is a ladder where the, the clubs at the top get the most and the clubs at the bottom get the least. But you can't, it would be crazy to take huge amounts of that money because it's not, I mean, at the end of the day, it belongs to the 20 whose intellectual property has gone into the league that season. And it's very clear, contractually and accounting-wise, it's that season's money. And then they're, they're not going to give, I don't think, masses away to do what? To perpetuate the excesses as you go all the way down the, down the pyramid. The financial situation is a challenge because you, are, you could regulate it. You could absolutely say everybody just lives within their means. Nobody's allowed to make a loss. You could. But that's the difficulty you create by doing that is you lock in this order forever. So then Manchester United would always have you know, the most money and you would never be able to invest in clubs lower down the pyramid to try and create this movement, which is the bit that the fans absolutely were you know, protesting to maintain, which is this fluidity of movement. So the whole regulatory framework is delicate. You could say nobody can spend more than they earn, but that would not allow for anybody to come in and invest, invest properly to move their club up and down the pyramid. Are you concerned that what these six clubs have done in the last week won't only impact themselves and the trust within the game for themselves, but it will actually almost impact the Premier League as a whole in terms of that sacrosanct constitution that you believe in? I, believe I in don't it. believe in it, but you believe in it because they've alerted government, they've alerted the fans to an extent that they never have before. There is a fan-led review. Do you believe the Premier League could come under attack in the next 12 months because of the actions of the top six? You, you, you know, you, you <laughs> listen, you're good at your trade. You, you put this you know, to me in quite a pejorative way. What do I believe? I don't believe life will ever be the same after last summer. You think there will be changes? Yeah, I think there will be changes. I think the actions of the six uh, have altered some of the dynamic forever. I would like to think that the six will get back round the table at some point, you know, not, not right away. I think it's, there's too, too much anger out there, you know, for that right now. I think there has to be some, you know, there, there will be, I'm sure, some, some constructive dialogue where there will be some change and there might be, it might be self-regulatory change. And yes, there might be some external regulatory change. And that's, and, and that is how, if you like, in, certainly in my time when I was there, that's how, the, a lot of the regulations evolved. There were some external pressures and there was some you know, regulatory, you know, legal re regulatory pressures. You have to also remember football, the first level of regulation is the law of the land, whether it be accounting law of the land or whether it be safeguarding government. You know, there's a whole lot of company law. There's a whole lot of stuff that, you know, competition law even. So there's a whole lot of regulation that goes on long before you get to the specific rule book of regulation. But I do think there will be some external pressures. I do think there'll be some internal pressures to change. And I, I think it's inevitable that there's some, so there'll, be, there'll be some changes, yeah. Should the top six be punished 
I'm not going to go there. It's not my job. I'm not in charge. I think there they has should to be, be punished. Well, there has to be. There has there to be has recourse to be some, for this. Well, there, let me put it this way: you use the word punished. There has to be some consequences. It just can't happen with there being no consequences. And I think you know you've used the word punished, but there's all forms. Okay, what, what, what can the consequences be for those well, six things clubs? Things have to change. There has to be something extracted for what they've done. Financial? I, Individuals? Enough. Remember, even the Premier League rulebook doesn't state, you know, and even when I was in post, now I'm not in post, I am not going to get involved in saying what, 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 what that should be, whether it should be fined or, or punishments or whatever. I don't like to use those language. What I'm saying to you clearly is I think something will have to be extracted, whether it's by way of undertakings, whether it's by way of meaningful undertakings, binding undertakings, attitudinal changes, there has to be some sort of extraction. And I'm not going to get involved in whether that's that's what you might call punishment or other people might call sanction. There's got to be something. Something has to be given. There is a growing wave of support for fan representation in football clubs at the highest level, even seats on the board. Do you agree? There has to be better consultation and better dialogue uh, with fan bases um, generally. Because as the last seven days has proved, you know, they are an entirely vital, you know, part of the operation of a club. A seat on the board? A seat on the board is difficult, isn't it? Because you've still, okay, what you can't do, in my view, is alter the fact that somebody can, can own, you know, a significant percentage, and those who own a significant percentage would have most of the votes. You can't entirely hand, you know, ownership over. But yeah, I do believe that this is now a time where clubs are going to have to look at the way they consult with, with their fan base. It's almost like there's an elastic band that snapped in the last, in the last week. They, it's been stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched, and there's been a snap, and that hurts. And therefore, I think things will have to be looked at and things will be different going forward. We were contacted by the legal department of the Premier League and we were warned of breaching copyright. Were you aware of that? Well, aware of it? I was behind it. <laughs> Your worst press may have been what was seen as a golden handshake. Do you understand why? Richard, so this section of the programme relates to my very short time at Valencia. And I was sent this on the, uh, within a week of my return, which is failure is a bruise, <laughs> not a tattoo. So it's... Is that all they sent you? <laughs> not quite. <laughs> I did get a few more messages as well on social media, and, and ever since, actually. But what it relates to, obviously, was the low point in my career, and I keep it up there for reference. So what was the low point in your career? Well, I've had a number. Um, of course, you know, not everything is straightforward and everything's linear. I had some sales, sales campaigns, even at Yellow Pages, that didn't work. And, and, and didn't come off. Um, same in the newspaper business. We launched a group of free newspapers that didn't, <laughs> just didn't work and we had to close them. And when you have to close anything, it's, you know, there's, there's you know, job losses and people's, people's lives. In football at the Premier League, there were some moments of tension. You know, I remember when Carling were the sponsor, you remember it was Carling Premier League, Carling Premiership for, forever. And um, I had a, a notion then that I thought we could do better than Carling, but I couldn't get somebody else in time, and this was back in the early 2000s. And so we let Carling go, and I didn't have another one absolutely in the bag, and there was a very, very difficult few months. Back pages of all the newspapers, Scudamore's job under threat, recommends to the club they let Carling go, hasn't got a replacement. And you did, yeah, you get, you know, you suddenly think, oh, here we go, and you, and it's, it's tough when the, uh, the back pages are all, all at you, you know. I mean, I was lucky, I've only had probably two, three or four of those, but there are some things that don't, you know, always go, go as well. One of the more difficult times was we launched an inquiry, we got back in 2007, got Lord Stevens to come in and look at a load of transfer deals. And, and that got quite difficult as well. I had private detectives following me, trying to, you know, dig, dig dirt on what, what, what I was doing and trying to sort of put threats and pressures on and everything else which, you know, goes with the territory a little bit, but we were trying to just see, you know, the legitimacy of some of the transfers. It got quite hairy and there were some people that didn't, didn't like what we were doing. And again, you just start to, you know, you sort of doubt yourself, but there's always bruises you, you, and you have, to, you, have to, you have to dust yourself off and learn and, and resort to the things that you know in your, you have to have some sort of core that you know what makes you tick and what makes yeah. the game tick. What would be your coping mechanism in the, those moments where you have doubts? My coping mechanism goes back to my dad, um, who, despite all his challenges, his phrase was, there's always somebody worse off than me. <laughs> mm. 
you know, and when he was running his disabled charity, they were all there and they all had various disabilities and, you know, and yet he was able to function. He couldn't work, operate his legs, he was always in a wheelchair, he had one arm that was gone, but he had his, you know, he had his mental faculties and his, his, his great message was always, there's always somebody worse off. And therefore, no matter what situation you find yourself in, your true north is, you're privileged. You know, you, you know the, just the jobs I've had and the work I've done, and working at the Premier League, no matter how tough it got, I mean, what, it's still the best job. I never had a, a really bad day at work. I had tough days, I had challenging days, but you can't say you've had a bad day when you're running a thing like the Premier League. How can you? I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost impossible to imagine. You, you're there where millions of others would want to be. Would that be your advice then to someone now, a young CEO, a young entrepreneur? What advice would you give them? Well, I, it's very. Di I think it's different now. My, if I was giving any advice to anybody, it is be prepared for you know, not to not to be too driven to a certain path and ambition because I think there's lots of disappointment along the way. The other thing is lifelong learning. That's the thing I would really probably always want to read and always want to learn. And even now, I'm too. I'm gone two years from you know from. From, from the real job, and I'm still reading avidly, I'm still reading about the game, I'm still keep trying, to keep, trying to keep on top of what's going on, because I, you've got to read and you've got to learn, and therefore this, I think the education system we have in the UK, if the one thing that we may need to make sure is that everybody comes out of either school or university not thinking that that's learning over, <laughs> That's learning starting, <laughs> you know, because just lifelong learning, trying to make sure, keep an appetite for learning is the, probably the, the most important thing. What would you class as your greatest achievement in your professional career? <sighs> I think, I, this is going to, I don't want to sound trite, it's not necessarily the commercialisation of the Premier League. I think it's more the byproduct of that success, which is the things that have happened you know, outside of that main event. So things like the massive increase in investment and activity in community. So if you look at what the clubs now do in communities, as opposed to what they did 25 years ago, it's enormous. And that's both a central Premier League thing and a local club thing. And then centrally at the Premier League, things like Premier League Reading Stars, all the things that, you know, all the massive community programmes that go on. Things like, and again, people now following this interview will understand what drives my DNA a bit, the moves to, to, to get compliance with the, the Disability Discrimination Act, all the things that every club, and particularly you know, you know, Man United and all the others have done to make sure we're uh, wheelchair access and not just wheelchairs, dis disability compliance at the clubs. So it's all the kind of things I'm sort of proudest of are the things that are beyond the things that you might think. If you look at now the quality of what goes on at the clubs, that's because they've been able to invest around all those other things. And those programmes, I think, are the things that I'm kind of most, uh, most, most proud of. Richard, your worst press may have been when you actually left the Premier League in respect of what was seen as a golden handshake that a lot of media and fans found very difficult to take. Do you understand why? Yeah, of course I understand why. Yeah, I do. And how do you defend it? Well, I mean, again, just, just I, like a lot of things, just deal with the facts. I'd been there for almost 20 years. Um, I'd, you know, I'd, re I'd resigned of my own free will, of my own accord, an annual general meeting in accordance with my contract, and the clubs in a, in a reaction got together without me asking, without me having anything to do with it at all, and outside of my contractual entitlements, they decided they wanted to basically, you know, make a gesture on my departure. It wasn't as publicised, it was turned into a, a two-year consultancy agreement and a non-compete agreement, so I couldn't actually go and work for anybody else that was anywhere near the Premier League landscape. Not that I would have wanted to compete against the Premier League anyway. It was a thank you for a job well done, having delivered over, you know, 37, about 35 billion in revenues across the time I was there for the league. And that was it. And so I, you know, as I say, I know it was, you know, it was much was made of it, but I don't to this day, you know, feel any regrets. I didn't think it was in my position having never asked for it. And it was, a, it was something they wanted to do. And I, I felt it was you know, okay for them to do that. So Richard, every guest on the programme gets a little gift that's relevant to them. So I'm going to hand you a Salford City pendant with mine, Nicky Butts and Ryan Giggs' signature on. And there's a little story behind it. So five or six years ago, when we first took over the club, 
we were contacted by the legal department of the Premier League and told that we had the same... That's right, the same logo as the Logo lion. as yeah, yeah. the Premier League line, and we were warned. Breaching copyright. <laughs> we were warned of breaching copyright. And I said, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> the Premier League suing so Salford City when we're in the Everstick North. And there it is. <laughs> and there it is. Were you aware of that? Yeah, of course. We've been like, I was behind well, it. So I was behind you, it. <laughs> so you have been suing it, little of course, old. yes. Can't you can't? I mean, the whole thing is the whole thing is based on copyright, isn't it? Whether it's illegal broadcasting or anything. Yeah, of course you have to protect your copyright. That's all we've got. <laughs> what, what what in the end made you not take us on? I, well, we changed the logo, didn't we? In the end. <laughs> so you changed yours. <laughs> yeah. So Salford City won. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about that. We've coexisted ever since, anyway. <laughs> Final moment. There's a challenge for every guest on the overlap, and yours is to name your best Premier League eleven in a four-four-two formation. And the four-four-two has to be yeah. Just a, just I didn't want you to play wing backs. So I wanted to try and get into a couple of teams to be fair, and uh, the manager as well. You don't have to pick me at right back. Four-four-two. All yeah. time. This, okay, this is all time. This is mine all time. Your yeah, all okay. time Premier League. Well, let's go spine then. Well, I, Peter Schmeichel in goal. Definitely. He's in. Good. John Terry is a centre back. He's definitely in. Roy Keane is definitely in midfield. And I've got to put Alan Shearer up front just because the number of goals and just. There's a tenacity just, to that spine, isn't there? Just the way. So that's, <laughs> that's where I'm starting. Now we've got to fill it in, haven't we? Yeah. Okay, alongside John Terry. I'm going to put Tony Adams, maybe not the right, you know, maybe I just Tony Adams because I just think well, everything about Tony Adams. We'll left back Ashley Cole, right back. Am I allowed to put Rio Ferdinand in right back? Oh, no. OK, uh, maybe that's a bit cheeky. <laughs> that that's a bit cheeky. I'll put Gary Neville in the right oh, back I position. Oh, you have the team, haven't you? <laughs> so now, if I go, oh, 4 4 2, that's annoying because I was rather going to, I would have preferred 4 3 3 only because of what goes on up front. So midfield alongside Roy Keane, I'm going to go Patrick Vieira and Frank Lampard. Two and four, three, three. And in order, in order, I'm afraid Sergio Aguero is going to have to be in midfield because I want Thierry Henry in as well, alongside, um, alongside Alan Shearer. That's a pretty good team. That's who I'm going with. And to and say you course, have no preparation time, so you've gone Schmeichel. Schmeichel. Neville. Neville. Cole. Cole. Adams. Adams, Terry, Terry, Keane, Keane Lampard, Lampard, Fiera, Aguero, Aguero, just in front of them, <laughs> behind Henri and Shearer. And the manager? Sir Arson Ferguson. <laughs> and <laughs> I just think they both bought something to the to the plate tectonics that pushed the Premier League forward. Sir Alex, of course, for everything he achieved and who he was and what he did. But also, Arsene, for just the innovation and the sports science and the, the professorial approach, I can't separate them in terms of their contribution, if you like. So I would just like a combination of them if I can. Is okay. that cheating? No, it's perfect. Okay. Richard, thank you very much for your time today. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.